You are listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, the fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Where are we, Lionel? We are upstairs in Bar Italia in London, Soho, Richard. A place with lots of connections with cycling, and not only because there are cycling jerseys hanging in the bar next door. We were in a little upstairs room in Bar Italia in Soho, um, where 10 years ago, Mark Cavendish sat here and launched his the first volume of his autobiography, Boy Racer. Remember, and in case we remember well, isn't don't we, uh, Daniel? Have you read it? Oh, yeah, poured over every word. Has he read it? <laughs> I think, Daniel, you had a hand in that book, didn't you? You, 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 um, well, I've you guided, read it. I've you guided, read it. you guided Mark Cavendish's hand in penning that book. And, Expertly. uh, yeah, Anthony, the owner, asking about Mark Cavendish just now. They're, they're good friends, he says. So, uh, well, we thank Anthony for letting us use this space to record this week's podcast. Um, what's, what's been happening, Lionel? What's the news? Well, lots of racing, as you'd expect from this time of year, Richard. Um, the first women's world tour race of the season, Strada Bianca in Tuscany, finishing in Siena, won by Annemiek van Vluten of the Mitchelton Scott team, second with Annika Langvad of Bowles Dolman, and third, Cassia Nuvadoma of Canyon Sram, who's been on the podium every year since 2016, but hasn't yet won it. Um, I gather, Richard, you'll be talking a bit about Strada Bianca and the other women's um, races and stories in the next episode of the Cycling Podcast Feminine, which will be out on Friday. It will be out on Friday, yeah. There's lots to pack into that and some, some really good interviews as well. The men's race, a little bit later on, was won by Julian Alaphilippe, which extended the Koenig Quickstep's run of consecutive one-day race wins to four after they won Omloop Het Newsblad, Kern Brussels Kern and Le Samin. Jakob Fulsang was second for Astana and Wout van Aert, was third for Jumbo Visma. Remember, he was third last year, very much his outstanding breakthrough um, performance on the road last year, and he's repeated it again this year. Really cracking finish to the race. We'll talk about that uh, in the first part of today's podcast. Just interestingly, the next few riders over the line, uh, Stenjek Stibar was fourth. He won Omloop, of course. Tish Benut, who crashed at Omloop Het Newsblad and had been a doubt for the race, clearly fit fighting fit and able to contest uh, at the front. Greg Van Avermaet, of course, um, prominent at Omloop Het Newsblad on the podium there. And Alexei Lutsenko, which basically says that it's all about form at this time of year rather than necessarily pedigree in the events. I mean, the likes of Tim Wellens were up there as well. He's been uh, red hot this spring. And Fulsang. And Fulsang, of course, yeah. Away from, well, carrying on in Italy, the, the following day, the Grand Prix Industria e Artigianato was won by Max Schachmann, his first victory for Bora Hansgrohe since joining from Quickstep. How was the pronunciation on the race there, Daniel? Um, um, seven for effort. Seven for effort, Napalm. Well, ten for effort. No, what seven for effort. Seven for effort. How about execution? Um, four for execution. No, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't bad, that bad. It was <laughs> no. the, the consonants <laughs> and vowels were roughly all in the right place. <laughs> Extraordinary. Oh, that's good. Extraordinary. That's good feedback. The thing is, you can't determine <laughs> what does it how mean? hard I was trying. What does it mean, Napalm? Tell the me that. The Grand Prix of Industry and Agriculture, I guess. No, not no? Agriculture. No, no cra- not Agriculture. Craftsmanship. Craftsmanship. The, the quality are. of being an artisan. What do you call that in English? Artisan. Um, artisan. An artisan. Anyway, Max Schachmann was the most industrious artisan of the weekend there. Ten for effort for him, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Parry Nice, not so much the race to the sun, but the race against the wind in the opening two days. The race is ongoing until the weekend, of course, but we'll talk about the opening couple of stages where crosswinds really cut the race to ribbons. Dylan Groenewegen of Jumbo Visma won both stages. The second of those two stages uh, run off an absolutely eye boggling mind-boggling eye-boggling 51 kilometers an hour it probably was eye-boggling for some of them um tough day out uh, with the wind cutting the peloton into pieces a few people have come off 
um, for the worse from those couple of days. Warren Barguil crashed out on stage two. Not great for his team, Arkea Samsic, who are still hoping to land one of the Tour de France wild cards. What, what, Rigoberto. What do you think, do you think is going to happen there, chaps, with the old wild cards? I, um, I mean, I thought it was pretty much a done deal for Barguil's team before his crash, um, and I expect Direct Energy to, to get the other one. Um, but now, not so sure. The big big rival, I suppose, is Vital Concept, which, who I get the impression really need a wild card, having missed out last year. But they're not in, they're not in a lot of form, are they? Um, no, and Brian, and Brian Cocker, their star rider, has really struggled for, um, well, over a year now. I read an interview with him a couple of days ago, I think with Cycling News, he said he was, um, he was getting his confidence back after a, a rough sort of 15 months or so, but... His results haven't been great, and um, the teams, they've beefed up a little bit over the winter, but they don't really offer anything on, as far as general classification is concerned. And, um, yeah, I'm not sure now. Boff, any any thoughts? Well, I mean, there's, there's time, isn't there, for Barguil to recover uh, from that before the tour? We don't know, but... You would think it would be extraordinary to leave out a... a st- multiple stage winner and king of the mountains winner mm. um, well i think the, the the news that's been coming through today about his injuries um is such that or, or are such that it sounds as though it might be quite difficult for him to be to make it back in time for the tour i don't know but mm. um, fingers crossed for him Rigoberto Uran is also out of Paris-Nice. He crashed and fractured his clavicle. And Mark Cavendish is pulled out after the first two stages. Um, so we'll wait, we'll wait to see how his uh, ongoing attempts to recover from Epstein-Barr virus go. Not sure when he'll be back in action next, I guess. milan San Remo, but tough to, tough to be competitive in that if um, Paris-Nice only lasts a couple of days. Just had a four-word interview with Mark Cavendish, actually, earlier today, Lionel. What were the four words? Well, uh, I said, are they rip- I asked him, you OK, question mark. He said, not sure. So more news. Hang on, more that's news two words. Breaks. That's only two words. Two, well, my, my question was two words oh, as I well. See. Uh, moving away from the racing, uh, the Italian sprinter, former world champion, winner of 42 stages of the Giro and 12 stages of the Tour de France, Mario Cipollini, is due to appear in court on March the 20th. He has been charged with stalking and assaulting his ex-wife, Sabrina Landucci. Uh, the, the allegations date back to December 2016 and January 2017. And also some very sad news to report. Kelly Catlin, three-time world champion on the track, Part of the United States Team Pursuit Squad that won in 2016, 17 and 18 and also an Olympic silver medalist in Rio in 2016 uh, committed suicide this week. She rode for Rally UHC Cycling. She'd also been studying at Stanford University. Uh, Computational and mathematical engineering was her subject. She quite a lot of coverage about this um, in the media this week. Um, particularly drawing attention to a blog she wrote very recently for Velo News, which it is impossible to read without uh, knowing um, what was going to happen next. Um, And some comments from her father have been reported in the media too, uh, pointing out that she crashed in December last year and suffered concussion and had been struggling with the effects of that. And uh, also he said that she had attempted suicide um, earlier this year in January. Uh, Really terrible story and uh, all of our sympathies go to the Catlin family. Unbelievably tragic. We had Kelly on the Cycling Podcast Feminar in 2016 over that winter um, we interviewed her and we actually played some of her violin because she was a very accomplished violinist as well. I mean, she, you know, she was obviously a, a good writer. She was a, a good artist. She, she was a good footballer. Um, obviously a great cyclist, very talented cyclist. Um, and just such a terrible tragedy. And uh, you, you're right, Lionel, that you read the blog and, and, and think, well, this was a girl under a lot of pressure and, and putting herself under a lot of pressure as well. But it's not, I don't think we can jump to conclusions about, you know, suicide is, is not cause and effect. It's, it's complicated and it's individual. And we don't know the full story or the full circumstances. Uh, we'll be speaking a bit about Kelly Catlin in this week's episode of the Second Podcast Feminine. And we hope to have a, a bit of a tribute from somebody close to her in that episode as well. But... Um, yeah, our our thoughts are with her 
family, friends, teammates. Um, it's incredibly sad. The fastest clothing in the world tour. The home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. The two uh, most important things are a saddle and a chamois or a short and you want it to feel good. I am Sepp van Marke, I ride for EF Education First. In the past I struggled sometimes with the saddle sore and with the new shorts I haven't had any problem yet. So uh, I really like the new uh, the new shorts. They said it was a new model of chamois. For me the, uh, the bib shorts are the best that I ever had. Thank you very much indeed to our headline sponsor, Rafa. Always grateful to them for their great support. And uh, we mentioned it last week, we mentioned it again this week, Rafa Custom, the new powerful, intuitive digital tool to help you design your own clothing. Um, Custom Rafa clothing. Lionel, you had a go at the tool last week and came up with a particularly fetching design for a Lionel Burney jersey, if I can call it that. (laughs) Well, I was... Yeah, I was using the software just to, you know, see what was possible, really. I mean, um, I, I think I, what it confirmed was that... You're not a designer. I'm not really a designer, no. Um, but it's leave, a great... It to people with a, a, more, a more creative mind. It's fun, it's very easy to use, and uh, if you, you know, if you do fancy yourself as a bit of a designer, get on there and have a go. You'll find it at rafa.cc, and we're hoping to maybe uh, do some kind of competition uh in conjunction with with Rafa on this to find a cycling podcast themed designed jersey uh, more news on that when we've decided what that will look like I've realized well um, no the the the, the, the listeners the designers will decide what the designers looks like. will decide our yeah we're, <laughs> we're we're outsourcing design of our next um uh, item of clothing uh, but some nice prizes maybe um, mm. up for grabs as well there uh, I should just mention as well while we're talking about Rafa uh, EF Gone Racing uh, the series of behind the scenes films uh, a few have been released already the Strada Bianchi episode uh, should come out today we're recording on Tuesday it will be coming out today or Wednesday uh, subscribe to Rafa Films on YouTube uh, to get all the EF Gone Racing films and just on the subject of cycling podcast kit all of the Peddler de Charme range is currently in stock. That's men's and women's jerseys, men's and women's T-shirts, and a cap. So if you want to uh, get yourself a Peddler de Charme T-shirt or jersey... Uh, and just ready in time for, for And yeah. Lionel. Just in time for spring. No former Peddler de Charme have been um, caught for blood doping this week, so it's been a cracking week for us. You know, no, we've got, yeah, we've got a couple of extra T-shirts, actually, to, to yeah, sell. Two, uh, two worn ones, <laughs> Genefiel and Pridler. Mm. Mm. Disappointing. We haven't really. The committee hasn't met to decide what also, we're going to decide their also fate. Also, chaps, I'm um, quite surprised by the lack of news on that front. It's all gone quite quiet in in Austria. We were saying that it's gone very quiet. Realised I forgot to introduce us at the start of the program. Uh, that that was Daniel Freib. I'm Richard Moore, and that's Lionel Burney sitting opposite me. If it's not too late to do that, shall we talk a bit about Strada Bianchi? We're going to talk about the race, and then we're going to discuss this question of whether Strada Bianchi should be a uh, a monument. There's always, I mean, it's a race that certainly uh, captures people's imagination and uh, has led to calls for it to be given monument status, whatever that might be uh, in in practical terms. But uh, the race itself, um, won by Julian Alaphilippe, uh, and it well, it was it was it was uh, as beautiful as ever. Uh, Wout Van Aert, as you said last year, very impressive at Strada Bianchi, really announced himself as a as a road rider, he rode well. Um, Jakob Fuglsang has been has started the year incredibly strongly, and I made the point to you two before we started. We were talking about you know what kind of rider does Stradibianchi uh, suit, and one of the great things about it, a bit like Milan San Remo, is you know there you've got uh, a, a GC rider, Jakob Fuglsang, a cyclocross specialist, Wout Van Aert, and uh, a kind of uh, Ardennes specialist, uh, Julian Alaphilippe, uh, all coming together. In, in the one race over the same course. But the one thing those three guys all have in common is a pedigree off-road. Um, Jakob Fuglsang was a mountain biker, Wout Van Aert, obviously a cyclocross rider, and, and Alain Philippe started off on a mountain bike as well, did he not? He is, uh, well, he's certainly got very good pedigree as a cyclocross rider. Um, I think he probably did mountain bike as well. Um, but Rich, I, saw, I, I sort of found myself... 
um, lurching from from previously having thought that this was a great virtue of uh, Strade Bianche that it does bring together all of well the, those kind of diverse abilities of riders to sort of feeling this year is I, I don't really get it as a race um, not that's not to say I don't like it I think it's a fantastic race but I, I don't really understand it to the to the extent well, that I think I understand or think I know what's coming in well we'll talk about the monuments in a minute but um, the, the the gravel the off road aspect of it um, I'm not going to say it leaves me cold but I don't really understand the extent to which it's affecting the race um, I discussed this with an illustrious former Strade Bianche rider this morning um, so much so that he he still um, has a couple of Strava KOMs in that race. So that, um, Dan Lloyd is the rider I'm talking about, and um, former rider, very much former rider. But you know, he was talking about, and he subsequently put on Twitter um, this idea of well, the, the pace being quite slow on the gravel sections, and therefore you do tend to get um, selections because um, aerodynamics is so important now that anywhere. Um, where basically the speed of a, of a race is reduced, um, even if it is on the flat, then you're likely to see more sort of splits, and that tends to decant the race quite early. People come to the fore quite early. Um, it's also quite difficult to organise a chase. It's quite difficult to be in the wheels. Um, depending on the weather conditions, you can get an eyeful or a mouthful of mud if you're in someone's wheel. So um, that also tends to separate the race uh, earlier, but well, well, let let me let me ask the question, Daniel. If if the race took place entirely on tarmac over the same sort of gradients of climbs and 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 so on, but if it was all on tarmac, would it be as broken up as it is? I, I suspect not. Although visually, it so is that not well, the it point? Is kind of the point, but I think it, it, sometimes this doesn't necessarily come across easily. Um, when you watch on TV, it doesn't look as though the gravel is having that profound an effect on on what's happening in the race. Um, and I, I think maybe what is underestimated about the course is that it's very, very undulating. Um, you know, there are a lot of climbs and the climbs aren't particularly long. The longest one is about 15 minutes to climb to up to Montalcino if you don't take a detour and visit one of the cantine and have a degustazione of Brunello, which I can recommend. Um, but, you know, they're about... 10 to 15 minutes the climbs um but there's not a lot of flat road um so there's a there are a lot of kind of anaerobic efforts um but as you say i suspect that it would be quite a different race if there weren't gravel sections and the gravel sections obviously visually and in terms of the character of the race um make a massive contribution to making it appealing yeah it's interesting you say you know, how did it stack up in terms of difficulty? Um, I've been looking on Strava at a few of the riders who've pu- who rode both Omloop Het Newsblad and, um, and Strada Bianca. And, I mean, it's difficult to interpret some of this data and say, well, that's definitely harder. But um, just looking at Alexei Lutsenko's data, he was fourth at Omloop Het Newsblad and seventh at Strada Bianca. Um, the average weighted power for the two races respectively, 293 watts for Omloop Het Newsblad and 312 watts for Strada Bianca. So a total workout, you know, burnt more calories in the Italian race to the Belgian race. The average speed was slower, but the average heart rate in Italy, 152 beats per minute against 137 beats per minute in Belgium. Now, that doesn't tell you everything, but it does tell you something. that It's a significant, um, it's a difficult race there's obviously a lot more climbing 3173 meters as opposed to 1822 meters I, I thought that was quite interesting and obviously bears out with Greg Van Avermaet as well who was uh, in the top 10 in both races um, so it's it's this thing of what do you judge a race on do you judge it on its difficulty or what it looks like or how entertaining it is or how well matched the riders are and I think that the the way that we're becoming accustomed to watching Strada Bianca is that we anticipate these gravel sections but don't necessarily know his, from a historical point of view exactly what impact they are having. It, it seems to me a race where all of a sudden there's gaps and then mm. is that gap closable? There's not the same level I mean, of context where when you watch Het Newsblad, do you not think, well, that gap now, 22 seconds, that's gone. We know the run in to the finish. We know that that is not closable under normal circumstances. Where here there's a lot less of, you know, historical kind of art, just 
visual comparisons to make. Yeah, absolutely. But would you guys agree with me that the the gravel sections themselves, um, it's quite difficult to to tell what's going on, how much that's affecting particular riders. You know that 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 statistic or the the fact that there are so many riders have been so many riders who have thrived in this race with a, an off-road background suggests that that's important but it's not immediately obvious that it's pretty smooth the gravel and um, you don't see you know all of the riders on one side of the road on taking a particular line doing better than the riders on you know who have taken a different line and um, you don't see riders sort of um skidding and sliding around and 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 visibly struggling on the gra- gravel well I, I, I take issue with that a little bit because i think there is a bike handling element to, especially on the downhills more than the uphills um there was footage at the weekend of uh, riders you know wh- wheels going from under them on the on the downhill bits and and uh, you know it was a it was a pretty good weather day when it rains or when it's and we've seen this in the giro as well when they've used those kind of roads that that can um that can really make it a, a different kind of race altogether. Um, but we shouldn't underestimate the the visual appeal, uh, should we? I mean, it's it's a sort of aspirational race. You know, I watch, I look at Strada Bianchi with the beautiful Tuscan landscapes and the, 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 the aesthetically very pleasing white roads and think, mm, that you know, I'd like to ride that. I don't look at Pyro Bay and think, I wish I was juddering over cobbles. And then, of course, you've got the finish in Siena, which... Mm is uh, if you're there, and I, I went to Stradibanca once in 2010 to watch it, and you're, you're a little bit short-changed if you've been up in the centre of Siena all day waiting for the finish, because it, it looks great on TV, the finish, uh, and it's the, you know, the setup with the climb uh, is great for, for the race, but if you're there in the, uh, in, in the middle of, of, of Siena waiting for the finish, well, you, don't, you don't see an awful it's, it's lot. It's a big shame, Rich, isn't it? There was a, to a certain extent, it's a shame that um, they can't do laps of the Piazza del Campo, mm. which you know is world famous because of the Palio um, horse race that takes place twice a year, once in July, once in August. The, the last winner, actually, or well, the winner of the second main Palio of last year was the, the Contrade. So it's Siena's split up into these little districts called Contrade, Contrades. And the, the, the winner of the last one was the Wolf, um, the, well, the female Wolf, and then, um, of course, you know, Julian Alaphilippe, the wolf pack. So there you go. If you're looking Ooh. for an omen. Well, they've, they've stopped. They're not, they're not really making it such a big song and dance about that anymore, are they? Um, Decoining Quick Step, um, probably. No, it's kind of after, gone quiet. Yeah, I think it's chastised front, it? slightly by events in Argentina at the start of the season. Mm. What, toning down the kind of the overly macho? I would say so. Sort of, mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, for the palio, don't they lay down a load of sand? So obviously the horses they can't run on paving stones, can they? So is it not? Is the piazza not filled with it? It's sand, sand napalm. Yeah. Um, I mean, if yeah. you ever get a chance to go to Siena on the day of the palio, I mean, it's the, it's it was the most exciting live event I've ever seen. Um, you know, uh, including all, all sport. You know, indoor cycling, even. You know more exciting even than that um but have, have you never have you never seen taylor swift no i've never yet. seen <laughs> taylor swift live um but of course unfortunately there's also <laughs> there's also a, a slightly ethically dubious aspect to the palio right? it's quite common for horses to die and you know i saw it when i was about 18 years old and you know i was young and carefree and didn't think about these things but now i'm a almost a grown adult then um i would i think i would have mixed feelings about going to see the palio daniel I mean, I'd say that the, the, the way that the, the positioning of the climb ending with sort of 300, 250 metres to go uh, means that it's almost a race to the top of the climb, but really it's a race to the first corner after the climb. Um, but what's, why, why can't they extend that finishing, you know, that dash through the town a little bit? Why can't they take them around, uh, you know, a, a quick lap? I'm, or could they do I'm a sort of, I don't, I don't know, sure is it just I'm pretty practical? sure that's to do with tourists and um, the, their reluctance to shut down the whole of the square because it is, you know, it's, Siena is a huge tourist destination and it's the fulcrum of, of that kind of tourist activity, the square. And I imagine they're probably reluctant, especially with a women's race earlier in the day, it would mean shutting it twice um, for, you know, maybe two hours um, all told. And I'm not sure um, whether they think they would get away with that. But, you know, the, yeah, there are other options. You could come into the 
into the town a different way. I mean, all of the roads are pretty steeply inclined up to the Piazza del Campo, but you could, you know, sort of zigzag and do a couple of different ones and and um, arrive in the square from a different angle, I suspect. But what do we make of Alaphilippe and de Kooning quick steps week? Um, I mean, an extraordinary run that they are on with uh, four one-day races, four victories. OK, Le Samin is not anywhere close to the same level as Omloop, Hep Newsblad or uh, Strada Bianca. And, well, nor is Kern, Brussels, Kern, really. But um, they're on a real roll. And um, I, does this ease the pressure or increase the pressure for the um, for the bigger classics to come. It's difficult to know, isn't it? But they've got they've clearly got a shout in absolutely everything, all the way through to Liège Baston Liège. Four different winners as well. Yeah, and because um, they're they're a team without an obvious leader going into the Tour of Flanders. I mean, they've obviously got Philippe Gilbert who won it a couple of years ago and seems to be riding very well at Paris Nice. We'll talk about that in the final part. Um, but you know, having all these guys in form and and the one I you know, I've said uh, for one, uh, Eve Lampart, who I think, and I was interested to hear in your special Lionel, which is available to friends of the podcast, that Lampart would rather win Pyro Bay than the Tour of Flanders, which is surprising from a Flandrian. But um, he rode pretty well at Strade Bianca, did a really valuable sort of team role, and has looked pretty strong in these opening races without really showing himself. And that is often a sign of, well, often the guy that wins Flanders has ridden like that. But isn't this just strength in numbers is is giving them the edge in these races, Daniel? I mean, it's not like everyone else is bang out of form. There, are, we we've talked about the um, the cast of usual suspects who have who have been really good this spring as well. But when it comes down to the crunch, De Kern and Quickstep just have options that other teams don't have. Yeah, I think so. Especially if you add Bob Youngles into the into the mix, I think he's he's going to stick around and do Flanders. Um, he's obviously got objectives later in the season, but um, he talks about wanting to do some of the classics this year. Do we know which classics he, he's he's put his hand up for? Yeah, I think up up to the Tour of Flanders, the only one not on the menu is, is Paris-Roubaix. He's not going to do that. Um, and then I think it's it's a case of the, the Giro is the next big thing for him, the Giro d'Italia. So he'll he'll presumably do uh, Bink Bank E3 and Gemp Wevelgem, you would assume. Um, and then the Tour of Flanders. So, and also there's the, th- the one day, three days of Bruges de Panna as well, which is, uh, I mean, that's a that's a slightly lesser, although it's in the World Tour, it's a slightly lesser race. But yeah, they're a formidable um, group, particularly when you think that you know Philippe Gilbert will come into it as well. Um, they could they could have a team where you'd look at it and say, well, six five or six could genuinely win these races yeah and i think uh, their collective strength contrasts with well, the the current position um of the team of their one well the main rival i would say is greg avermate i think he he looks to be in really good form um but ccc aren't aren't having a great start to the season um certainly not in terms of results um they're one of three or four teams that are actually really struggling i, I was just looking yesterday at the at the rankings and and what all of the teams have have managed to do in these first um, two and a half months of the season, three months of the season, and um, quite alarming. CCC and Katusha as well. Um, Katusha have had three podium places so far this season, all of them from Marcel Kittel and nothing from anyone else. They look like a kind of Diet Coke version of BMC, don't they, CCC? I don't know, they just don't have the the BMC swagger or the, the, the sense of bling, I don't think. They look... They look overly reliant on on Van Avermaet. I, you don't see many other um, CCC riders in race, or I haven't noticed them anyway. That's going to count. That is going to be difficult for him, isn't it? Yeah, if he's, he's racing more or less in isolation in the last sort of fifty kilometres of the of the big races. But uh, we shall see. Shoot, uh, shoot at du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. That's the voice of Seb PK, race radio at the Tour de France, to remind us to tell you that this episode is sponsored by The Economist. The Economist is about far more than just economics and finance. It covers a range of subjects from world politics and business to science, technology, the arts, the environment and even sport. It's been a trusted source of intelligence for over 170 years, which is about 165 years longer than us, Rich. Um, It's for the kind of person who never stops asking questions and wants to know why the world is the way it is. Rich, you've been reading The Economist this week. What has caught your eye? Subject close to my heart, Lionel, whiskey. It's Uh an article, the headline, Going Against the Grain. 
and it's how disruptive technology may change the whiskey industry. And there's an E in brackets in the middle of whiskey there because, of course, Scotch whiskey is spelt just with a Y and whiskey from Ireland and America and I guess Japan as well is spelt with an E. Um, and this is about a couple of companies in the US, San Francisco and LA. Appropriately enough, the whiskey in LA is called Abomination because it's whiskey that does away with the aging process. The all-important barrel aging which gives whiskey its colour and its flavour. Um, these companies, these upstarts in the US, think they can produce whiskey in just 24 hours in the case of the company which is called Endless West in San Francisco or the, the one in LA which produces the, the whiskey in six days. They claim it has exactly the same taste and, and quality as whiskey that's aged for between 10 and 20 years in old barrels. Uh, I um, will reserve judgment on that until I've tasted it. A little bit shocked uh, towards the end of the article to read that the, the Economist correspondent tried some of the LA whiskey or the San Francisco whiskey, I can't remember which one, with a slug of ginger ale. Ginger ale? Water only, please. A, a dash of water and definitely no ice. Oh, oh, I don't a, want to sound like Daniel Freep here. You're a but classic, classic consumer. Just a, just a dash of water, eh? Okay. But we'll see about this whiskey. We'll see. Well, if you'd like a free print copy of The Economist uh, with no whiskey um, delivered to your door, you can text the word cycling to 78070. If you're in the UK and you'd like a copy delivered to your door, the code is cycling and the number to text is 78070. So a question that is uh, becoming mm, a slightly louder every year um, is should Stradabianchi be a monument? I mean, what? there are five monuments, Milan San Remo, Tour of Flanders, Pyro Bay, Liege, Bastogne Liege and the Tour of Lombardy, Il Lombardia. Um, what's unclear is, you know, where... At what point were they grouped together, those races, and called the monuments? We know that they're all very old races, very long races. Um, but why, you know, why are they the ones that are known as the monuments and, and other uh, famous one-day classics? Amstel Gold Race, even Flesh Wallone, or, uh, you know, why are they not? Uh, now Strada Bianchi, although it's, it's only been around for, what, 12 years? Um what what you know what what do you need to qualify as a monument and who would decide well i, I suppose the first thing to set out rich is that this is a is a, an entirely sub subjective unofficial denomination that i have the impression has become more and more prevalent in the last 10 15 years or so um i i have a vague memory um of reading cycling books which date from the 60s and 70s, French ones mainly, which re refer to um, the, the monument classics or Le Classic Monument. Um, but it's never been, there's never been any kind of official stamp put on this by the governing body, um, the, the UCI or, or anyone else. I think it's a, a term that probably originated from a, a journalist. Um, and so it's quite difficult to qualify what they are, what they should be. Um, there are various different criteria which the ones we do call monuments seem to have in common. Um, they all date from before the First World War, um, but they're not the only races that do that. Paris Tour, for example, um, I think the first edition of that was um, 1896. Um, they're, they're all long. Um, I think they're all, well, they're all generally above 250 kilometres, aren't they? Am I right? 250? Around about Around that. Around about that, yeah. Um, which contrasts, obviously, with a race like Strade Bianche, which is what's well, currently about 185. Um, and, I mean, I I don't have particularly strong feelings about this, or I thought I didn't have particularly strong feelings about it, and then I, I started thinking about it over the weekend, and I realised I do feel fairly strongly that um, it is not yet a monument. D did you compile a eight, list of 18 or, other races that should eight, become monuments before Strada Bianchi? it shouldn't be a monument. And the word monument, incidentally, the etymology of the word monument, is it comes from the word, uh, the Latin word monere, or, which means kind of to remind. Um, so in the sense that uh, Strada Bianchi is, is, is a bit of a throwback race, uh, ridden on the, mm. the white roads, um, it, it might seem quite appropriate for the appellation of a monument, but then um, I don't think any of the monuments really fulfil that criteria of the or criterion of of reminding us of anything in particular. Um, I think we we kind of misuse the word monument generally in everyday 
in, in everyday speech, we, a monument is kind of a, a sort of big building or, or structure. No, that, not a word I use no, a lot in no. everyday speech. But, but isn't, isn't, isn't it kind of a sense of, of their permanence, that they've always been a part of the calendar? The, the age of them is one thing. You know, Richard, you mentioned uh, Amstel Gold, but Amstel Gold mm. only came along in the mid-60s. I mean, it's a, I should it's have said a comparison. Um, and, you know, w- the whole history of cycling has, has tried to group races together. We have the sort of catch-all term classics, you know, and you could say, well, is Le Samin a classic or is it just a, a, a beefed well, up and that, and that's and a, got semi-classics as well. Semi-classic. Semi-classic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Usually movable feast line or the, the term classics. I mean, some mm. people um, only use that term for spring races in, you know, France and Belgium. Um, you know, the Italians will liberally use that for, well, there, there used to be a whole kind of glut a series of classics in August, which were pre-World uh, Championship races, the sort of uh, Giro de Lazio and races like that, which some people still refer to as classics. London Surrey Classic? Well, I mean, this is a thing, isn't it? It's a word that's used to bestow a kind of historic sense to, to a new race. I mean, the London Surrey Classic, predated by the Wing Canton Classic, which was included in the, the, the World Cup in 1989. I was just going to talk a little bit about the, the Challenge de Grange Colombo, which was uh, a season-long competition held between 1948 and 1958. And it was named after Henri de Grange, of course, the, the, the founder and director of the Tour de France, and the Giro d'Italia director, Emilio. Emilio Colombo and of course the two races then were even more um, tightly linked to the respective newspapers L'Equipe and La Gazzetta della Sport and then together with the Belgian newspaper Het Newsblad um, they came up with this competition which included the Tour and the Giro and then a sort of a, a handful of the classic races including Flesh Wallone, Paris Brussels and Paris Tour. Uh, what surprised me was that Liège Baston Liège was not added until 1951 and the Vuelta was added in 1958 and uh, this series sort of evolved into the uh, Super Prestige Perno, there, there may have been a, a gap, but the Super Prestige Perno was a season-long points-based competition. It got very complicated towards the end, the way the points were allocated, and um, uh, by the end of it, you know, really it was it was dominated by the same sorts of riders, um, Sean Kelly, Phil Anderson, and Greg LeMond, who were capable of doing very well in one-day races and also in uh, the big tours. And just to go back to something we were talking about last year, the reason that the Super Prestige Perno Trophy, one of the reasons it came to an end in 1987, was because that was the year that the French government banned alcohol advertising uh, in sport in France. And so the Super Prestige Perno, sponsored by the Aperitif Perno, disappeared. And then the UCI stepped in and, and brought the World Cup into being in 1989 and that really is where you the i think the kind of the 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 cementing of this idea of monuments begins because the world cup was very much a a fusion of the old and the new you had the five big one day races then some mediums sort of you know some some middle age races came into it uh like uh the the championship of zurich the the classic of san sebastian which at the time was only eight or nine years old i think together with the brand new Wing Canton Classic, which was an attempt to uh, open up a market in the UK. The first race was held in Newcastle. I actually went to, to that race. Franz that Masson. Day. Franz Masson won, won it. it. Yeah, he did. Um, and so the World Cup then became this kind of hotchpotch of one-day races, some of which really were important and some of which were kind of brand new. And I, I suspect it sort of evolved out of that to try and elevate the, the really important races just that that step or two above some of the others the question is if you know it, taking this hypothetical argument um uh, you know if if there was there were criteria established for monuments and included that they have to be 250 kilometers would adding 80 kilometers to strada bianchi make it a better race i what? suspect not i mean it's strada bianchi strikes me as it's a it's a kind of it's a race that combines um sort of history and modernity because it's quite a short race and it's shortness actually i think makes it a better race yeah and and also i mean one of its big weaknesses i think rich is that at the moment i don't have the impression that anyone really targets it or or announces at the start of the season that it's one of their big goals but um, would anointing it as a monument change that and 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 mean that people all of a sudden were doing that um you know, and it, the fact that there isn't more build-up, there isn't more hype, there aren't more journalists there, there aren't pre-race press press conferences from all of the main contenders. Um, you know, that's also maybe a result of the fact that 
it's not a monument, it's not given, um, even informally, more status. It would also mean that Italy had three monuments, which would be half of the total monuments. The question I have for you chaps is, say we decide that they're only, and I think we are in a position to decide this, uh, they're, 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 they're only allowed to be five monuments, which one would you drop in order to make room for Strada Bianchi? Well, I wouldn't. Oh. What about you, Napalm? I, I, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I mean, that's the question, isn't it? I mean, it, you're, you're adding a monument rather than, rather than replacing one, I guess. I would drop Il Lombardia. Blah. Oh. Heretic. What a, what a heretic. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever been to that race? <laughs> well, no. No. That's why. Yeah, but hang on. This is the other thing, isn't it? Because Il Lombardia, even even in its sort of slightly more favourable position on the calendar now, is a, uh, you know, it's not something that people start the year necessarily thinking, is it? Well, because, I, I don't know, Napalm. You know, it's so I don't late. Know. They, uh, I think more than they do with um, Strade Bianche. But um, th- there was actually a proposal last year. It was occasionally La Gazzetta make these kind of provocative semi-wacky proposals um, about moving races around and the, well, the latest one was crowdfunding to set up an Italian World Tour team but last year they floated the idea of moving Il Lombardia to the spring um, so that all the classic all the monuments were basically back to back in the spring I, I hope that's not going to happen I don't I can't conceive of a reason why that would happen um, or good reason anyway that's a, but I mean no, the other, no I mean the, the it, Surely, I mean, Il Lombardia is kind of, it's for the riders who um, are targeting the World Championships. It's kind of either, uh, it's a second bite of the cherry kind of thing, yeah, isn't, isn't it? it? Um, whereas Strada Bianca really is, is, is uh, what you're saying is, it's only really available to the riders that are going to then ride Tirreno Adriatico in preparation well, that, for the Lanzarote. That's another Raymond. problem well, with it. Um, I, I meant to look this up, but maybe you chaps will know. I mean, have riders ever done um, Strada Bianca and then flown to... To do Paris Nice, is that something that happens commonly? Is it ha- is it something that happened this week? Um, I mean, in Oof. theory, it, it is possible, um, but it generally doesn't happen. It's generally the the teams send riders who are going to do Tirreno to to Siena the weekend be- before, or the yeah the three or four days before. Why don't I do some live fact-checking and we'll get this put in by our editor. We'll answer that question here and now. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for supporting the Cycling Podcast. Reminder, you can get 25% off your Science and Sport products if you go to scienceandsport.com. Enter the code SISCP25 at the checkout. That doesn't work in conjunction with any other offers, but it will get you 25% off all your sports nutrition uh, products that you need. Uh, If you've got a question for our science and sport experts, uh, please email us, contact at thecyclingpodcast.com or leave a voice memo on our WhatsApp number, plus 447971338205. Uh, We're recording a little bit early this week because we've got an episode of Femina coming out later this week. So we haven't been able to get an expert response to one of your questions this week, but we'll return with that next week. But do keep your questions coming in. And thanks once again to Science of Sport for helping us uh, stay on the road, as it were, Um, fueling us, I suppose. Uh, We were going to just chat about the first couple of days of Paris-Nice. Stage three is unfolding as we speak. It does look, I'm glancing at it, like the wind has... The wind has died down after two pretty fraught days. Um, lots of casualties, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a literal sense, with Rigoberto Uran, who, who looked very good and, and could certainly handle himself in the crosswinds uh, out the race. And also Warren Barguil. Um, Fabio Aru has pulled out this morning. Mark Cavendish is out the race. And, well, I mean, it's been tremendously exciting racing. You know, crosswinds just add uh, so much difficulty to the racing breaking it up there's been you know fantastic footage of echelons spread all across the road Luke Rowe has looked as if he's in his element I mean he's made it look quite easy and you know if you're in the front and you're you're comfortable in that front group it it does look easy and and it's it's almost like the 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 swan gliding across the water you don't see the 
the frantic activity happening a little bit further down the road. Well, that second stage into Belgarde, where the little six-kilometre triangular circuit at the end, um, there was a wonderful moment when they did it the first time, the right-hand turn, and he came to the front of the bunch and did a very theatrical finger in the air, a bit like a, a golfer judging the wind before playing That's a delicate I mean. He looks shot. like he's having fun. He's yeah. playing. And, and, I mean, he's been a great help to Egan Bernal, who's been the revelation in terms of of the GC guys um, able to handle themselves. He's dressed in full tights and, you know, looks like he's out on a training ride, but has been riding exceptionally well as well. Very impressive. And then row, I mean, it all kind of came back together again. And then, um, well, you know, it's a, it's a mathematical equation, isn't it? The, the crosswinds, because the road is only so wide. And once the riders are fanned across the road and there's no more shelter and there's no shelter in behind, um, something has to give. And that's where the gaps open. And uh, Luke Rowe went to the front the second time round and split it again uh, on the run into the finish. Um, I have to say, not just him that caught the eye. I thought Jumbo Visma did very well. Dylan Groenewegen as well. You know, when you're the man that's trying to win the stages, he took responsibility, particularly on the second stage when it was it, uh, arguably a lot harder even than the first stage. You know, not not shy of going to the front and keeping the pace high, showing intent and, and making sure that the riders behind uh, couldn't come back. And uh, yeah, it's a really interesting couple of days racing, which, um, it, you know, the Let's make no bones about it. On paper, the wind needed to blow for those stages to be interesting because uh, otherwise they would just have been you know, big bunch sprints with uh, the whole peloton finishing more or less together. One little quirk in the results was that um, the first day the lead group was around 60 riders. I think it was exactly 60 riders. And then the second day was, um, if you take into account, there's three or four riders that came in just behind the bunch because Luke Rowe sat up and obviously lost a few seconds. That group was 45. And uh, 33 of them were riders who'd been in the split the day before. So, you know, it, it's it, the wind does catch people out, but it, it's not a fluke because the riders who are either trying to win the race overall or trying not or trying to win the stage or are just good at riding in these conditions you know consistently make the splits and uh you you do you can look at the results it's and see strength that, and skill yeah isn't it? it's strength a combination and skill, isn't it? oliver nass another one that caught the eye he, he's you know he's very very good uh, uh, roman bardi's talked about just how good he is in those sorts of conditions and it's it's when it's done well like that it's really impressive to watch but they do have that knack of um, making it look quite easy, which doesn't reflect how hard it actually is. One other little quirk from the results was that on stage one, uh, Anthony Turgis of Direct Energy, Christophe Laporte of Cofidis and Oliver Narsen of AG2R finished um, 10th, 11th and 12th. And the following day, they finished 12th, 13th and 14th in exactly the same order. So today, but we already know the results, don't we? <laughs> yeah, 16th, 17th and 18th. <laughs> But uh, that, I think that gives you an indication of how these riders, they ride. I mean, if you if you know a wheel to trust, you, you'll you ride on that wheel. I'm not necessarily, necessarily saying that's exactly why they finished all together, but um, the riders themselves know this this guy's good in the wind so I can stay near him and won't get caught out. And they know the riders more to the point who they, you know, if they find themselves next to, um, you know, next to somebody they know is not good in these conditions, you know, stay stay well away. I'm in I'm in the wrong position here because he's going to get caught out, which means I'll get caught out. It's uh, it's it's one for, like you say, skill and strength, but but knowledge as well. I mean, I mentioned Bernal. Sorry, Daniel. I can hear you're desperate to come in there, but um, Quintana's been very good as well. He's only lost 25 seconds so far. George Bennett. Um, those guys have ridden really well so far. Simon Yates is surprised. He's lost seven minutes. Um, he's a guy who you would expect to be uh, pretty good um, in those conditions. He was good on the first day, a... wasn't he? But Do you know what happened to him? Or No, I mean, no, no, he, came into, he came into Paris and he's talking about going for stage victories rather than the overall. Um... Right. So, yeah, but I mean, it, it, it's, it's always, I mean, can, you know, Bernal obviously deserves uh, praise for the way he's ridden, but Quintana's been quietly riding pretty, pretty well as well the first couple of days. Yeah, and for every rider who has found the the wind and the conditions to their liking, there've been some some riders who have had an absolute nightmare. Um, on the the Fabio Aldo is one example whose troubles continue. Um, he had a, a horrible year last year and hasn't started very well this year, and um, has just pulled out. In fact, today um, he lost 14 minutes. 
um, on stage two as well down general classification. Louis Meinkes was another one who, well, he actually pulled out with Mark Cavendish um, on stage two. He didn't enjoy himself there, but um, you know Cavendish usually goes very well in crosswinds. So slightly alarming that he struggled so much, but of course he's. He's on a, a long journey back from this, uh, the virus he's been suffering from, the Epstein-Barr virus. is trying to, trying to sort of see the big picture. Um, but, you know, with echelons, if you don't relish those conditions, if you go in almost expecting to take a beating and expecting it to be brutal, then um, almost invariably you will take a bit of a beating, won't you? She mentioned Roman Bardet as well, another one uh, well protected by his team, but... He's still up there overall, and uh, clearly... Who's going to win? Pretty, well, I mean, it, Is it all over? It's a test of form. Well, y- you look at it so far, and you, and you think... I mean, one point that Rob Hatch in commentary has, has made is that Pyrenees the last few years has been uh, decided by very small time margins. That might be might be different this year with the carnage of the first couple of days, but and it's been a very close well. race, and it's often been decided on the last day. Yeah, time trial, I think, will sort it into an order before getting to the climbs and the route itself isn't particularly hard is it the Col de Torini is well it's a that's a difficult climb I think that's on Saturday um, but normally it's a bit tougher it, it's a race actually that I you would think maybe Juliana Philippe might have won um, he's ridden Paris Nice in the past and it's it's just been a bit too hard for him in, in terms of the climbing and um, you know with the form he's in and without as much climbing as it's been in the last couple of years, maybe it's one that he, he might want, but he's riding to Renault Adriatico instead. Another rider who has struggled, um, and who, who has struggled, in fact, since last year when he won Paris, is Marc Soler. Um, mm. He has suffered, and and he did well in Catalonia last year after he won Paris, but has really sort of flattered to deceive since then. Um, but yeah, there are still, there are a lot of, I mean, as much as, the, the, the splits have been big and people have lost a lot of time. There are still some good riders with good pedigree with sort of big ambitions for Paranese who are still in the shake-up. I mean, even someone like Cal Majan, I'm just looking, he's 18th on general classification, um, 25 seconds down, and, and Bardet still there. And even Tony Gallopin on a, on a course like this, he might have enough to to be a threat. Um, and then you've got Bernal and Kwiatkowski, who Kwiatkowski I saw um, in an interview today, talked about, he's still talking about his... his future Tour de France ambitions which you know uh, I'm not this saying an interesting anything one. I'm not saying yeah. anything well a couple of things on that because if you look at AG2 Art and Sky you say the obvious leaders are Roman Bardet and Egan Bernal but the AG2 Art led it out for one of the, the, the bonus sprints yesterday and actually it was Galapa that came across the line first and of course he had that breakthrough performance at the Vuelta last year didn't he where he really showed that he, he could be a GC he, rider. So maybe... He can ride with the best guys on climbs yeah. up to sort of 20 minutes. Um, mm. and, uh, which, and you know, he's not going to find... I, I'm not sure how long the, the, the there is one big summit finish at Paris Nice, isn't there? But um, he might be okay. I don't think he'll be able to attack the best riders on, on the longer climbs, but um, he might be able to stick with them and, and take some time somewhere else. And Kwiatkowski, um, he... You know, he was in that split. Luke Rowe, always a very selfless rider. You know, when he had a chance to win a stage at the Sun Tour this year, he gave it to Owen Duell. He's not he's not won a lot of races, and that's something that we'll hear about from him in our forthcoming interview, which I'll mention at the end of the show. But um, Luke Rowe did a, a fantastic uh, sort of team job and then sat up. Kwiatkowski, I felt, if Bernal is the leader, and we don't know that, um, then Kwiatkowski uh, seemed to me to be hedging his bets coming into the finish where he left Bernal on the front uh, as the group behind was closing and was clearly saving himself for the, the sprint, a sprint that I don't think he was ever going to win against, you know, the likes of Trenton and Grunewagen. But it, it, and Sorry, Rich, go on. Uh, well, it, it looked to me like Fiakovsky was running there for, for a stage. Um, I mean, it, uh, yeah, if... But he could be a GC guy, I don't know. Well, you know, if um, Kvyatkovsky is has this long-term ambition to target the Tour de France and and follow a similar trajectory to what, well, certainly Geraint Thomas has done, and he's, he's part of a long-term project, we think now Sky is going to continue under a different name. We might actually get some news on that in the next couple of weeks. Um... But if that is the case, I, I think races like Paris and winning races like Paris should possibly be a, a rite of passage for, for him, and it would be a good idea, for him, 
um, to, to really target the GC this week. Absolutely, but they, you would imagine that Bernal will also be right. You know, on his path to the Giro, uh, it's he will want to win races like Pioneers, will he not? Well, I think he has got a bigger fish to fry in, in the Giro. Um, I, he doesn't need to win Pioneers, does he? I mean, he, he doesn't have to prove to anyone that he can win a, a stage race like this. Um, Kwiatkowski has won stage races, of course, in his career, but this would be one of the biggest ones. On Sky, we haven't really talked about Team Sky, but yeah, we, we believe that uh, a, a deal has more or less been agreed to, to back the team. Um, this has been hinted at uh, by David Walsh in the Sunday Times as well, but uh, we understand that Ineos a Chemicals Group um, are, if not already signed up, then certainly in pole position to take over Team Sky. It's, uh, it's uh, a company run by, well, Jim Radcliffe is the is the man behind Ineos, and he has recently moved to Monaco. He also happens to be, uh, according to the Sunday Times Rich List, the UK's wealthiest man. He has a net worth of twenty-one point zero five billion pounds, which, you know, um, sponsoring Team Sky will be will be loose change. But yeah, we we understand that's the case. Trying to find out a bit more concrete information, but um, Team Sky apparently secure. I wonder if Kwiatkowski will remain part of the setup given the CCC team's Polish um, uh, uh, you know, sponsorship and whether he might end up at that team instead. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, they've certainly got a vacancy for a GC rider at CCC, haven't they? I spoke to Jim Okovic at Kern, Brussels Kern, and he said they were quite enjoying the fact that they haven't got to build um, two-thirds of the year around one race, the Tour de France, now that uh, Richie Port is not there um Did he ever get his bag back I don't, Port, I don't you know? know i don't know i think it's still a, a still a sore it's still point, an odyssey <laughs> i mean not sure not sure okovic would care about richie port's bag all that much um but uh that they, they haven't they haven't really got um anyone for gc and you're absolutely right i mean the, there is now a, a, a very definite st- um, Polish strand to that team's DNA and uh, Kwiatkowski is a former world champion and someone who you know would, would give them an immediate kind of at least somebody to build a GC and classics, and classics. campaign who, around who also has one more year I think on his Sky contract um, oh really yes I think he signed a three year extension in 2017 um, so oh yeah. well so an extension covering the seasons 2018, 2019, and 2020. Right, I thought he was like a contract at the end of the year. That, that goes that there goes that theory. Yeah, but I mean, it depends, doesn't it? I mean, we don't. I mean, we we well, we we can see really that the CCC budget is not of BMC um, levels from from their pomp, and Kwiatkowski would be very expensive uh, anyway. So, but you know, stranger things have happened. Riders have left teams when they've still got a year to go. But of course, that that comes at a cost. Just lastly, before we move uh, on, I um, really feel like we should um, talk about Dylan Groenewegen because he's won a stage of everything he's done so far this year. Valenciana, uh, the Volta Hour Garve in Portugal, and now the first two stages of Paris-Nice. And who knows, while we're actually recording, might get a third, possibly. Who kn- No? The, very possible. The Atomic so tadpole possibly. is looking decidedly atomic, isn't he? He is. I mean... We, well, you know, it takes form and fitness to make all of those selections. And as I said earlier, you know, he took responsibility. But um, the, the way he beat Caleb Ewan, who himself has also been um, in good form so far this season, was, I mean, it was it was close. But And, you know, Jumbo Visma going from Roglic winning in the Middle East to Van Aert getting on the podium in Strada Bianchi and Dylan Grunewigen winning sprints. They've got, they're fighting on all fronts and, uh, you know, could have a strong classics team led by Van Aert uh, clearly well set up to win bunch sprints and they've got good strong GC guys as well because Kreuzwick started the season well as well obvious plug there for our friend special Chasing Sky the the Jumbo Visma story um, that is available to friends of the podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com uh, a very interesting listen it is too I did interview Dylan Grinnewigan for it but I, I didn't make the cut I'm afraid it's that good. You didn't well, even put that in. Grunewagen is a very, very good cyclist. Right, but not he, he. Not always such a great interview. I, I think one of these guys who 
is quite good to interview after the race. I remember a few years ago, the year 2016, when Cavendish won all his stages, and there was one stage in particular which was a slightly uphill finish where Gronewigan came from miles back. And if you watch the overhead shot, his acceleration over the last 150 metres was much faster than anybody else's, and it was really impressive. I remember interviewing him then about that, and he was really good at talking about the intricacies of the sprint and what he'd done, etc. Um, very good at that in the moment, describing something that's just happened but um not so great sort of in a in in that reflective mood that you want in a out of season training camp but you know well your episode i mean it was a real um you know very insightful look inside the team um so if you want to sign up as a friend of the podcast and listen to that go to the cyclingpodcast.com forward slash friends it, before we go we should mention a, a new little spin-off series that we're running uh, it starts next week it'll run throughout the classic so it's an extra little podcast a week it should be on the shortish side um not short i mean not short over half an hour but um not quite as long as the regular episodes and this well it has its um the catalyst was the interview that we did with adam blythe uh, towards the end of last year adam was a very good uh, interesting interview and got a, a big response from people and he himself seems to enjoy the medium and uh, came to us uh, wondering if we could host some interviews that he wanted to do with some of his fellow riders. Um, Adam, if you're listening, uh, got the first uh, two. Uh, if you could uh, follow up with the other interviews soon, that would be great. We know you had you became a father again last week to twins, uh, but we're waiting, <laughs> we're waiting. No, the first couple are with Caleb Ewan and Luke Rowe, and they are really interesting. He interviewed Caleb Ewan at the Tour Down Under, and I... Uh, learned an awful lot about Caleb Ewan from this interview, um, about his background, about his career in cycling. Really, really fascinating. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you do get a different sense of, of him and, and Luke Rowe when he talks to Adam as well, because they go back an awful long way. So he's got another few lined up, and uh, they are set to be very interesting. They will launch next week and run throughout the classics. Any other business, chaps? Well, before we go, Rich, the live fact-checking um, can confirm that no riders went from Strada Bianca in Tuscany on Saturday to Paris-Nice in France on Sunday this year. No riders. Well, there you go. Wow. Um, if you know of any other, if any riders have gone in the past, I'm sure it's happened, um, get in touch, uh, let us know. Uh, and um, in terms of combining or going from one race to another, um, who was it last week we talked about? It was... It was, Roger Kluger. Yeah, that was it. We were talking indoor cycling, quite, so I kind of switched off. Um, but the, the the greatest feat ever, as far as I'm concerned, is still Yenon, Zenon, sorry, Zenon Yaskula, uh, the 1997 Tour de oh, France. Yeah. Um, finished Tour de France, went straight to, I think it was Charles de Gaulle Airport, flew to the Tour of Portugal, Volta a Portugal, and was competing in the prologue the next morning, and then won the Volta a Portugal, and... Um, met his future wife, a podium girl. So packed a lot in, did Zenon. And then retired, <laughs> and then retired at the end of the Volta Oh, they did. Yes. Knackered. Remarkable. So if anyone, if any listeners can beat that story, um, then you're welcome. <laughs> next There's week, one... next week, Rich, I will be revealing the 18 riders most likely to win Milan San Remo. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, on that, Johan de Munch, who was the subject of one of our French specials last year, um, I, I'm going to need to do a live fact check on this, but I'm pretty sure he did, he did something that ran right up to the start of the Giro, and he completed one race and then went straight to the Giro, which had already started with an, uh, uh, an exhibition stage. He, was, he didn't ride the exhibition stage, but he, which was just held to... Uh, give somebody the pink jersey mm. and so he joined in after one day of the Giro and then went on and won it Sean wow. Kelly used to ride the Tour of the Basque Country didn't he um, in between the sort of Flanders and Roubaix yeah, apparently he did apparently there's going to there's one journalist who's going to be covering the, this year's Giro d'Italia and halfway through competing in the French Speed Golf Open and then going back oh, wow. to the Giro d'Italia <laughs> oh that's my even, goodness that's even more remarkable extraordinary and then retiring <laughs> <laughs> anyway should we should we leave it for this week chaps Definitely. on that note <laughs> thank you very much Lionel thank you Richard thank you thank Daniel you. <laughs> 
You have been listening to The Cycling Podcast. Subscribe to our newsletter at thecyclingpodcast.com to get all the latest news and special offers delivered straight to your inbox. This episode was edited and produced by Tom Wally. Tom Wally.